Um, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, uh, keynote speaker for today, uh, so, uh, uh, Sander de la Rambouille, I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Sorry, Sander, or Sander. Uh, Sander is uh, uh, an energy and climate coordinator at uh, the Consulate General uh, of Denmark um, in Palo Alto. Uh, through a long-term partnership uh, between the Danish Energy Agency and the California Energy Commission, Sander uh, translates uh, advancements uh, and best practices in uh, Danish and California energy policy uh, on uh, building decarbonization and integration of renewables. Uh, today, he will be sharing uh, some of the lessons learned uh, from Denmark uh, uh, and about his uh, team's collaboration with California. Um, and then uh, please note, uh, that we'll do a question and answer session online, um, and uh, that's where uh, Sander will be uh, answering uh, questions. So please welcome uh, Sander to the stage. Thank you, Ryan, for that introduction. I believe I don't even need to talk anymore about what we're doing. It's so, 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 so good, really. Uh, thank you also to, to Alex Chase, to, uh, to 2050 Partners, the, uh, the CalBEM organizers for inviting me here. It always feels kind of uh, special to be on you know, a California-focused event as, a, as a, a foreign diplomatic representative. So I hope today I can, I can explain to you a little bit why Denmark is here in California, um, why I'm here at this California Building Energy Modeling Symposium, and uh, how I would like to maybe get in touch with many of you uh, for, for seeing how we can move this agenda further together. I do have to say a disclaimer at the beginning that, um, sorry, I, I do have to say a disclaimer at the very beginning that I'm not an absolute expert on uh, building energy modeling. Uh, uh, luckily, I have a team of nearly a thousand people working back at home at the Danish Energy Agency who is responsible for the building energy code in Denmark. And I will always ask those people for their expert opinion. So uh, yeah, just, just, just keep it in mind that I might have to defer some of the questions to them. But otherwise, I'd be really looking forward to, to this discussion with many of you. Uh, so yeah, uh, going green with Denmark. Uh, you might have seen in the title that we like to label ourselves the California of Europe. And you might be wondering why so? Because after all, Denmark is really not that close to California, geographically speaking. We're, we're, we're out on the very other end of the Atlantic. I, I make this trip a couple times a year. It's about an 11-hour flight. And um, yeah, Denmark being in the Nordics, one of the Scandinavian countries bordering uh, Germany, uh, Sweden, Norway. Um, geographically speaking, we don't have so much in common with California, actually. Um, we're only about an, uh, an eighth of the sizing of, of California in terms of uh, population and size. Um, we do have a very long coastline. And as you'll see, that is playing a very, very crucial role in our decarbonization efforts. What makes also Denmark maybe a bit the California of Europe is that we uh, have been focusing on decarbonization for, for quite some time, and that leads to, uh, to Denmark having the fifth lowest um, CO2 emissions per capita of the European Union, and adjusted for, for GDP, uh, we're actually at the very top. So what are our, actually uh, our climate goals in Denmark? So our, um, our climate goals are regulated, actually they're enshrined in law in Denmark through the Danish Climate Act. And the Danish Climate Act has determined that we need to get to 100% uh, renewable electricity by 2030. Uh, we should uh, achieve a 70% greenhouse gas emissions reduction uh, by 2030 compared to the 1990 levels. And we uh, should be fully uh, net zero emissions uh, by 2050. Again, that's a goal that's uh, a little bit further ahead, and by now it's not even all that ambitious anymore. I think we, we have decent hope that we might even be able to get there a little bit sooner. Um, 2050 is, is, is also just in line with the rest of the European Union, I have to, I have to say. Um, as you see, uh, as, of, as of 2020, we're at a little bit over two-thirds of renewable electricity in, in our grid. Um, a, a good plurality of that is, is offshore wind power approximately accounting for, for 50 percentage points uh, as of today. And so far already, we have reduced our emissions by 57% compared to 1990. So what, um, what makes Denmark successful in being able to move the needle on decarbonization and, and in our attempts to achieve our climate targets? 
it's really a very, very strong consensus all across the economy and all across society that climate change is something we need to address. And actually, um, it, is, it is believed by a large majority of the Danish to be our, prime, our, our first and foremost uh, issue to be solved this century. Um, we have a very open way of sharing information and data across the public and the private sectors. It's also something I'll go back to, back to later. So, so companies and citizens have a lot of access to their own data when it comes to energy performance and also uh, to, to their performance relative to, to their peers uh, so they can make a comparison. Uh, also, whenever the Danish government is setting new climate targets, it always goes in a very close collaboration uh, with the Danish industry. There are many, many roundtable discussions going on every single year uh, on when we're moving um, our climate targets for every uh, different part of the economy. And uh, because of the broad support from industry, we're able to move quite successfully on those. And through um, approximately now, um, I think three decades of, of very, very targeted climate action, um, we have uh, developed quite a bit of expertise in, in these areas. They all tie together in, in the sense that uh, because of our experience in energy systems and, and scenarios and energy modeling, uh, renewable energy integration, energy efficiency and flexibility and district heating, all of those together have led to a power grid that is extremely reliable. It has the least downtime of, of any power grid in, in Europe. Um, I believe from the top of my head, it's about 21 minutes per, per, per consumer per year on average. Um, and many of them don't even experience any, any power outages at all throughout the year. Um, the district heating network actually supplies the lowest cost of, of uh, space and water heating of any type of, 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 of utility. Um, and also offshore wind power uh, through um, the many offshore wind farms that we have developed. The first one was actually in 1991, which was the first offshore wind farm globally. Uh, offshore wind energy by now does not need any subsidies anymore whatsoever, and it has actually become the cheapest form of electricity in, in our grid. So with all this, with this knowledge in mind, we, uh, we realize in Denmark we're only a very small country, as you saw in the beginning, we're, we're, we're less than 6 million people. Um, and on a global scale, we own, cannot really make so much, of a, so much of a punch, so much of an impact on the global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is why uh, our regulating agency, the Danish Energy Agency, has, has decided to, to partner with many different countries across the globe uh, to see how we can exchange best practices in en energy policy, especially when it comes to uh, involving you know, all the different stakeholders, public and private sector, in, in achieving our climate targets. Um, we, we support, in a way, the work of our, of our colleagues at the concert, uh, to which I'll come back also in a minute, on, on, on trade. But our focus as a Danish energy agency is really, first and foremost, a government-to-government -government cooperation on energy and climate policy. Uh, yeah, Denmark represents only uh, less than 0.1% of the global population and about 0.1% of the global emissions. But through our many, many partnerships, we cover a, a majority of both the population and the, and the global greenhouse gas emissions. So the fun, the fun fact is that if, we, if we're able to have an impact of approximately 0.7% in greenhouse gas reductions with all the countries we work with, that has more of an impact than eliminating every single gram of CO2 from Denmark's emissions. Um, so we're based in California here in, in Palo Alto. Uh, we're actually a fairly large representation considering the size of our country. Uh, we're, we're about 45 people right now in our office, spread across uh, seven teams. Of those 45 people, approximately a good third work on our green agenda. Um, and um, I have, I have uh, one colleague, Klaus, who's, who's the energy attache, and I, we work on the government-to-government -government cooperation. And um, yeah, have been doing so since, uh, well, our team has been doing that since 2018. Uh, the basis for our work in California is a uh, memorandum of understanding or a set of memorandum of understandings with uh, the California Energy Commission. Uh, we started out working on energy efficiency in industry and buildings and also on offshore wind, uh, which of course is big in Denmark and rapidly up and coming in California. But as times moved, um, we have also started to expand our cooperation in areas where we feel that we're both uh, developing and trying to figure out um, how to develop better policies 
Uh, those include zero emission transportation, uh, carbon removal, and also what we would like to call in Denmark Power to X, which is um, the use of, of renewable green electricity to produce a variety of other uh, energy forms and products, uh, such as but not limited to uh, green hydrogen, um, e-methanol, ammonia, e-fuels, etc. Electrification is, uh, or sorry, a decarbonization of society is, is mostly based on, on, uh, on several pillars, on several instruments that kind of work in close tandem together in Denmark. Um, as you just heard, and as of course the, the conversation goes these days, uh, a lot of focus is on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonization. And that goes first and foremost through electrification, but we do believe in Denmark that it goes very, very strongly hand in hand with um, energy efficiency, just trying to reduce your overall energy consumption. Uh, we think it is so important, uh, first of all, because we're in a colder climate, so we spend a lot of our energy on, on, on heating, and everything we can, we can save there will reduce overall the, the cost and the, and the complexity of our electrification processes. Uh, using less energy will also mean that we can install, for example, smaller heat pumps, uh, it also leads to a less impact on the grid, um, and overall just the whole electrification process becomes a lot less, less complex if we can also combine energy efficiency. Uh, of course, there are a lot of ways in which we can directly uh, switch fossil fuels for electric power. Uh, we see that, of course, in space and water heating. We see that in road transportation, in electric vehicles. Um, and uh, there are also some areas where, you know, at least for the, for the short to medium term over the next decade, uh, there are some hard to abate sectors which might not be able to electrify uh, this, this decade. And we need, we need to find our alternatives in order to get to our 2030 intermediate goals. Um, so that's of course where, where fuels such as hydrogen and other e-fuels come into play. Uh, again, as mentioned, uh, using primarily our, our wind power to produce all of those through electrolysis and then further on into methanol, ammonia, and, and synthetic, synthetic fuels. Um, again here, you'll see that uh, the focus areas of, of, of where we want to collaborate with our partner countries closely aligns where we see opportunities for electrification, for decarbonization, either through direct electrification or indirect electrification. So those includes, as mentioned, industry, uh, homes, district energy, and, and transportation. Uh, what has really helped uh, the electrification efforts in Denmark is that we have quite a favorable situation when it comes to uh, to electricity network. Um, as I mentioned, it's 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 highly reliable. It's relatively inexpensive. It's becoming increasingly green. Uh, the goal was to have a 100% renewable electricity by 2030. It actually looks like we might get there even one or two years before that. Um, and because electricity is getting cheaper over time. Um, or at least the generation of electricity. And because of, um, because of CO2 taxes that we do have in, in European Union and especially also in Denmark, so we have the European uh, cap and trade system and European CO2 taxes, and then on top of that there is also Danish CO2 taxes on, on fossil fuels. Uh, we have a very favorable price ratio between, uh, between uh, fossil gas and electricity. So currently, as you see in the graph, it's, it's around uh, fossil gas is, is approximately half the price right now uh, compared to electricity for the same energy content. Um, but then, of course, if we factor in that, for example, a heat pump might have a coefficient of performance of, say, three to four, that means that, that a lot of electrification efforts just have, are viable just through simple payback. And that's even before factoring in all the different incentive schemes and subsidies that we, that we do have. So now zooming in, of course, we're, we're here for, for building symposium. So, so what are we doing specifically in buildings? Um, there are, again, a couple of, uh, a couple of different uh, legs in, in building electrification and decarbonization that, that come into play here. Um, first and foremost, uh, efficiency, reducing our overall energy consumption. Um, secondly, uh, district heating. Uh, around two thirds of the buildings in Denmark is connected to district energy. And the philosophy is, is that if we can decarbonize our district heating system, that saves us um, having to install individual heat pumps. With all the different supply chain issues that we're facing these days, and uh, of course a lot of challenges in the whole supply chain, from production to insulation, uh, correct insulation, uh, district heating is really saving us, and I think helping us a lot to, to stay on track on our climate goals. 
And for all of the homes which are not connected to the district heating network, of course, heat pumps. So yeah, district heating, it's, uh, it's, it's such an important component that I just want to mention it here uh, to, to sort of show how we've been transitioning because district heating did not necessarily start out as a super, super uh, green source of, of heat. Uh, back in the back in the 60s and early 70s, a lot of it really was powered through through fossil fuels. Uh, we were hit by an energy crisis, like many other parts of the world, in the early 1970s. Had to reduce our reliance on imported oil and fossil fuels. First, actually, it transitioned into coal because it was available domestically. But then, uh, very early on in the in the 80s, already it turned out that you know uh, coal also has has even more um, detrimental effects to the environment. And that's where, where biomass started to, to gain popularity. Uh, still, as of today, a majority of, of the district heat network is, is fueled by, by biomass that is uh, combusted in combined heat and power plants, uh, so providing both electricity and heat. And usually the ratio in those CHP plants between the electricity production and the, and the heat production can be, can be moved through, through the seasons, uh, can be adjusted. Um, right now, it does. We do count it as as renewable, especially when it concerns like non-virgin biomass. Uh, a lot of it comes from agricultural waste, um, but we also do see it as a sort of a transitionary period, where hopefully, uh, over the next decades, it will increasingly uh, become uh, transitioned towards uh, towards large-scale heat pumps. Um, in this graph, it says there's four percent of the of the district heating comes from from uh, large-scale heat pumps. I believe as of today, we're already closer to, to, to eight, nine percent. Uh, just in the last two years, a lot of large scale uh, heat pumps have gone online in, in many of our city utilities. Um, I think the largest one last year was around 50, 50 megawatts. So we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to um, data in buildings, uh, there's, there's something I'd like to, like to zoom on in a little bit here which is what we call energy performance certificates. So about the Danish Building Energy Code, we have, like, like California, have had building energy codes since the 1960s. Our building energy codes are, are performance-based, uh, first and foremost. Um, and since our first iteration of the Building Energy Code in 1961, uh, compared to the latest iteration um, in 2020, um, we have uh, reduced the, the maximum allowable uh, energy consumption for, for heating, ventilation, and, and cooling and hot water by nearly 95%. So all new buildings in Denmark are actually very energy efficient as they, as they come. Um, and the building energy code is, is updated every, every five years. So the funny thing is, is that we refer to the latest code as, as uh, building regulation 2020. But actually we had an interesting code cycle in 2018 where we also introduced new building energy codes then. So actually our newest energy code is going to come online in 2023. Um, so about L energy performance certificates, it is really um, that, uh, of course Denmark like California has recognized that we have so many existing buildings and building energy codes will move the needle on all new buildings, but doesn't necessarily have a big impact on the energy performance and decarbonization of existing buildings. And this is really something where we um, want to share maybe some, a little bit of our experience um, in the sense that um, all um, existing building owners, when they want to either sell the house or rent out the house, they need to contract a, a certified energy consultant in order to perform an energy audit of the, of the building. Um, and through the energy audit, they'll, they'll obtain an energy performance certificate. The EPC is, uh, is valid for, for 10 years, unless there are any major renovations being done in the house. Um, you, see, you see here, it has, a, it has a letter, like a mark D. Uh, the scale goes from, from A being very energy efficient to G being very energy inefficient. It's, it's always comparable to, to houses of a similar size and of a similar vintage. Um, and these uh, ratings from A to G are very familiar for most Europeans. They're used all across the, the industry in many appliances ranging from light bulbs to cars, uh, everything has an energy label, so people very, very easily know how to compare comparable houses to one another. Uh, it consists of uh, the energy label, rated A to G, and it also, interestingly, this is, this is an important part, contains uh, specific recommendations that the, uh, that the auditor has found while touring the house, uh, which will give the, the homeowner an estimate of what the upgrade would cost and what the estimated energy savings would be. 
Um, and this is kind of how it looks like. Uh, the funny thing is, is that it is actually an online database, and this is just what I pulled up from the online database. You can put it in an address, and you can, if you're looking to buy a house, and you can see for that particular address if the owner has obtained an energy label, and what, how the energy performance of the house is, and also what kind of uh, upgrades were recommended by the auditor when they audited the house. Uh, and actually, it has shown that this has had a, quite a big impact on the energy uh, on the energy upgrades that have been done to houses after an energy label had been uh, been obtained. Um, it showed that um, in order to uh, so, so it's, it showed that in the markets that people were looking actually actively for homes with a better energy label. So home sellers were incentivized to actually invest in their in the energy performance of their home to get a better energy label. Uh, because it had sh been shown that the better energy label had led to an increased uh, selling price of, of the house. Um, also, we use, at the Danish Energy Agency, we use the energy label, this energy performance certificate, for targeted uh, funding and incentive schemes. Um, so, of course, as I mentioned, uh, we want to get as many of the buildings that are not on the district heat network to switch over to heat pumps. Uh, currently, around 400,000 buildings in Denmark, that's, uh, that's around 15, 20% of the buildings have, uh, don't have, have, have an oil gas boiler. Um, and the plan is that over in the rest of the decades, um, nearly half of those will convert to district heating. For some of them, they're too far away from existing networks where it would not make any sense. And we want to have those um, convert to heat pumps by the end of the decade as well. So for, for the uh, buildings are currently uh, using oil or gas burners. Uh, those are targets for a heat pump installation program where we incentivize 30% of the total installed cost of a heat pump, including any consulting fees. Uh, the building owner has to work with a certified installer to ensure a proper installation practice. Our research had shown that using a certified installer versus a non-certified installer had improved the performance of the HVAC system by approximately 18%. So that's why we work only with certified installers. Uh, and the idea is, as, as mentioned, that by the end of the decade, all of those buildings have converted to heat pump. On top of that, buildings with a poor energy performance from, from label E, F, and G, they uh, qualify for additional subsidies for, for better insulation and other energy upgrades. So what are we looking for with the, with the cooperation with the California Energy Commission and our stakeholders here? Um, for, for, the next, uh, for next year, we're looking to increase the discussion with the California Energy Commission, of course, on the 2025 Building Energy Standards Code. Uh, in Denmark, as I said, the new energy code is coming online next year. Uh, it's going to be our first iteration of the Building Energy Code that will have, or the building standards code that will have uh, requirements for embodied carbon. So we're doing a life cycle analysis of building materials using um, using the uh, using the uh, the product declarations, and uh, we're also actually working with local government first and foremost in the Bay Area through through Bayren uh, to see what opportunities there might be for us to collaborate uh, on reach codes locally. Uh, we know that there is some interest in the in the energy performance uh, in in the in the energy performance certificates, um, so that's where we'd like to collaborate. And then we also work to introduce sort of a Danish approach to to auditing, uh, which may be different from the typical ASHRAE audits and might be able to augment uh, what would be a normal a normal ASHRAE audit. Uh, so yeah, if you have any interest in any of these topics, please do reach out to me. Um, of course. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions now or otherwise over, over email uh, later. And please feel free also to stop by in Palo Alto when you're in the area. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much. I think uh, to keep us on schedule, we'll be taking questions on the forum, okay. if you wouldn't okay. mind checking it later. Sure. Um, so just check in on your device and you can uh, submit questions there. Um, from there, let me get the slides up for our next situation. Um, do you want to introduce while I slide? Or <laughs> Thank you, Sander. If I could have the panelists come up while we transition, please.
So I'm Alex Chase, 2050 Partners. Welcome again, everyone, to 2050 or to uh, CalBEM. Um, as, as we get set up here, I want to tell one quick story about Sanders. So I met him last spring in Los Angeles, and I thought, wow, this might be great to introduce Sander to this CalBEM community. And I reached out to someone at the CEC. I said, how's the partnership going? And they said, well, you know, we have a lot of these partnerships with different countries. And to be honest, a lot of it is just one way. They're learning from what's going on in California, but said this one was a true partnership where it's a two-way learning uh, between, and, and they're learning a lot from California and California is learning a lot from Denmark. So um, it was great to hear that. And in the spirit of learning, um, I thought that was a great way to kick off CalBEM. Um, now I'd like to transition to our first panel.